Good morning, afternoon or evening, wherever you are. I'm Paul Claft and welcome to my studio. Now, what have I got for you lovely lot today? Well, slightly different this week. We've got another one of Paul's Q&As. And these are questions from our Facebook group as well as comments here on YouTube. And it won't be just me rabbiting on. I've also got plenty of demonstrations for you as well. So come and join me and we'll do this step by step together. Right, so one of the questions that I was asked quite a lot is how you make your videos. Now, I appreciate that's not of interest to everyone. So what I've done is put a short video of that at the very end, including a little studio tour. So coming up now, I've also got a very short video on all the events, holidays and workshops that we have planned for 2023. So again, if you don't want to watch that, you can just move forward about a minute. OK, so here are the events we have planned for 2023 in conjunction with our partners Harmony Voyages. Now we start the year with our two week winter sun retreat on La Gomera, smallest of the Canary Islands. Now there's lots to do there, including painting every day if you want. It's a stunning place with amazing music acts each evening. Next we have in April. Now we're going to be very much part of the Costa Music Festival in Ibiza, held in one of the most fantastic locations. Then on to May, and we have for the third year running a five day painting retreat at the stunning Powder Mills Hotel here in East Sussex. Now the May event is already fully booked, so we have added another five days event in September. On to June, and we're really looking forward to the Rhine River Cruise on board the Amadeus Queen. Now this includes everyday art lessons, along with top music acts, show of hands at Richard Thompson. Then finishing the year, we have another Costa Festival, this time in Portugal. Now we did this one last year and it was fabulous. And again, we'll be jam packed with great music acts, as well as painting every day if you want. So, for full details of all these events can be found down below in the description on our dedicated events website. But for my weekly classes, one day workshops and outdoor painting days, please visit my own website. Thanks for listening. So Lynn and many others have asked about gum Arabic and what does it do and how you use it in your paintings. Okay, so what is gum arabic? Well, it's a natural ingredient. It's the sap from the acacia tree and is also the binder used in most watercolor paints. And you can buy it in liquid form as in this bottle here from Windsor & Newton. Now, I don't tend to use any of it in my work, but it can be really useful if you find your washes are drying too quickly when you paint wet in wet. So here are a couple of quick examples. First, I'm simply using only clean water and dropping in the corresponding colour to the scene above to create a soft water reflection. Now, I always tilt my board to let the paint run down. Now, you can see once it's dried, although I have some lovely wet and wet blends inside the wash, I haven't got that soft edge that I was looking for because I wasn't quick enough in dropping in the colour into the wet area. So let's do the same again but this time making a mix of roughly half water and half of the gum arabic and we'll do exactly the same. So what it does, it slows down that drying process and also gives you some very interesting effects. But of course with the original one you can always go back in with some of my favourite techniques and that's smudging with a damp tissue to get that soft edge back.
Now, I've had a surprising amount of you ask for a demonstration on watercolour black paper. So perhaps that one is one for a future demonstration. So watch this space coming soon. OK, so quite a few have asked me about the painting that sits behind me here. And they've said, could you do a tutorial on that? So it's one that I painted ooh, quite a few years ago when I was in my detailed phase. And it probably took me four or five days to paint. So I'm not sure it will make a good tutorial. And I don't think I'd ever be able to paint it again. OK, so two questions that I'm asked the most are probably the one about paint consistencies and getting those right. And also how to simplify a scene to paint it without being overwhelmed have an overworked painting and what elements should you keep and which ones are not important now both of those questions i answered in in a fair amount of detail in my last q a so if you have a look up there <laughs> that'll take you directly to it and it won't mean you leave this video it'll just save it for you at the end okay so jenny has asked what piece have you painted that you absolutely hated and can we see it and also how much alcohol is in the house. Right, first of all, you can't see the painting because all the ones I hate oh, screwed up and thrown into the bin of shame. And as far as alcohol, surprisingly, not that much really. Margot drinks it all. Really? No, not really. I don't think I'll get away with that. Now, Doreen and many others have asked, what does it mean to paint in a painterly style? OK, so here is a painting I did many years ago, and this is an example of something which is not painterly. So it's not just about how much detail there is. It's more about the fact that you can't see any of the brush strokes. So it has more of a photorealistic feel to it, more like something that you'd see in real life. Whereas this painting, although, yes, it's much looser, you can see the individual brush strokes and it has more of an arty and more perhaps less realistic feel so this is what i would call more painterly okay so david and joan and many others have asked i struggle with perspective anything would help especially with buildings at different levels now i have done a fairly detailed video on one point and two point perspective that's up here somewhere but i have got this little short demo to help you with buildings at different levels Okay, so here are three houses next to a road looking directly from above. And we know that if all these are parallel or in the same plane, then all those vertical lines will go back to the same vanishing point. Just as we see here from this one point perspective from my book. Now, what if we put a house here and say it's up on a hill on a totally different level? Now, it doesn't matter how high it is, if it's still in the same plane, it will always go to the same vanishing points. And here's the hill. Ah, but what if one of the houses is further down the road and just around the bend? Well, the first two houses, as we know, will have the same vanishing point. But this one around the corner is not in the same plane, so it will have its own set of vanishing points. And then same again if we add another house further around the bend. Now, Danielle has asked, what kind of paper do you like for line and wash? I usually have plenty of heavy, rough, cold press, but I hesitate on using this because I'm afraid the pen will skip on the rough. Well, I've used all three main types of paper for my line and wash, and I find that using a waterproof black marker, you can get a nice solid line on all three textures. But what I really like is to use black India ink then I dip in with a stick that I picked up from the garden. Now on hot pressed paper you get a fairly solid line, but I love the more textural line you get with cotton based cold press and rough papers. And it was some cold press ash that I used here on this parrot.
Now, B has asked, you sign your name, PNC. What does the initial N stand for? Well, that's nice and quick and easy to answer. All right, Natter. Really? Okay, so this is an interesting one. Rose and David and many others, in fact, have asked, I would like to understand about what is meant by style and how to find your own style. Now, this is something I do get asked a lot, particularly in my classes. What I would say is don't try and search for your own style. Let it find you, because it will happen. Everybody paints in a different way. Some people paint smaller, some people paint bigger, some people paint lighter, some people paint darker. You're all individual. You all have your own unique way of painting and you can't try and paint like somebody else. So your style will just naturally come out. Now I find this very interesting because when I have my watercolour classes we all do step by step the same painting and we put them up along the wall at the end and we have a look at them all and what gives me most pleasure is the fact that everyone is different. They're all based around what I've taught. They're all based around the same subject but they look different and those styles have just naturally come out. As a okay, so Peg asks, I'd like to know your top 10 basics for good practice habits. Being a beginner, it would be helpful to know how to practice brush strokes, etc. Well, I suggest for beginners, practice your brush strokes just using one large brush and get used to just using that. Some flat washes, squiggles, thin lines, pressure on and pressure off, a flick off, and you have to be careful how you say that, pressing down hard then lifting off, just play around and get confident with what one brush can do. Now here perhaps some sort of flowery shape. Then dropping in water and then some thicker consistency paint. some leaves, all done with one quick stroke. And then you get some lovely textured ends. The dry brush technique with quick horizontal strokes and with your brush flat to the paper. little bit of splattering now you can never practice these types of brush strokes enough and you don't even need to use your best quality paper for it and of course use both sides Okay, now Susan says, is Bockingford made of cotton and does paper have a shelf life? Well, Bockingford, no, is not made of cotton. It's a pulp based paper, but it's a really good paper. It's an excellent paper. Um, it's made by the same people, St. Cuthbert's Mill, who makes Saunders Waterford. Now I'm one of these people who says that you don't necessarily have to use 100% cotton paper. Good quality pulp based papers like Bockingford is fantastic, especially for beginners. I use it all the time. Now does paper have a shelf life? Well, I'm not sure if you use paper that might be 50, 60 years old, but I've used paper that's probably 10, 15 years old. And I think as long as it's stored in a dry, sealed place, I think it should be fine. 
So Simon asks, what is the painting you're most proud of and can we see it? Well, this one, I think it's probably 20 years old. I wish I dated it, um, but it's one of my favorites. Now, I think the reason why I like this one is because it's from a photo that I took myself while on holiday with my mates on the Norfolk Broads all many years ago. Now, it's got a good sense of light and for me, just the right amount of looseness and detail. And I think I only use two colours on this. So yes, this one, one of my favourites, but that could easily change. Okay, so Paul has two questions. Who were the most influential people in the young Paul to choose a career in art and why? Hmm. Probably my, my art teacher, Mr. Brooks, when I was all of 14, 15. Um, the art lessons in our school were dreadful. Most of the kids just used to muck about but I used to love it and he was very encouraging and I think he sort of steered me in the direction of art and said that it could make a possible career. And he also asks, who are the three most influential artists on you today? Not in the past, but now, at this moment. Okay, well, living artists, um, ooh, I probably have a three. Now, I love the work of Joseph Zwobvik, I'm sure I pronounce his name wrong every time, but I love the way that he creates that illusion of detail without painting detail. Love his work. A similar artist I would suggest is Elvira Castanet, perhaps a little bit looser. I love his compositions and just the way he seems to throw paint at the paper and come up with these beautiful, beautiful masterpieces. And one final chap, mm, they're all blokes, even though I do like Anne Blockley and her abstract experimental paintings. I'll have to say Ray Bulkwick, who's down in the West Country here. Now, he likes to experiment with his watercolours. He uses lots of mixed media, a lot of pastel work in his paintings. And I just love the freshness and looseness that he achieves in his paintings. So those three, plus Anne. Now, in a recent video of mine, I showed how to use this scaling tool to help with getting the proportions right on this gentleman's face. Now, I had quite a few of you ask why I flipped the tool around, which made me think perhaps I didn't explain it well enough. So, the adjustable screw isn't in the centre. So this measurement A, when flipped around, is wider at the other end. So, measuring this A, flipped around, gives you again a wider measurement at B. All to the same scale. Simple, but ingenious. So Mary has asked, where do you get inspiration from? Now that's a good one, but I think it's from everything around me. Every time I go for a walk, I always have my camera, I'm looking up at buildings, I walk out to the road and nearly get run over. But I think just the world inspires me. I also like to use websites like Pixabay, which have a great wealth of photo images, which you can just look through, which can inspire you. Um, it's great to have Margot where we can sit and we chat often and sort of bounce ideas off each other. Um, and also I would say from the photos that you guys send me. I mean, often I get pictures from you, which I look at and think, yeah, now that'll make a great tutorial. So do appreciate all of you who send me your photos. I do look at them all. Okay, now Vicky has asked, I have trouble getting the thicker consistency when mixing. I can get the right color, but in getting the paint out of the pans, it usually ends up being far too watered down. Do you have any tips or tricks for this? So with a set of pans, and this is my Van Gogh pocket set, a light spray is always a good way of activating the paint. Then, as long as you press down fairly hard into the pan with a wet brush, you should be able to pick up a lot of creamy pigment. However, I do find that if I want to get a nice lot of strong colour, then I'll use a tube. It's already going to be semi-moist and you can really get around all the paint and pick up lots of gooey colour. And then you can always add extra water once on the paper to dilute if necessary. Okay, so Rita has asked, 
Will there be more portraits? Well, yes, if you like them, I'll do them. Yep, so watch this space. Now, Sherry has asked, why don't you have a Patreon account? And that's quite interesting. Now, two reasons, really. Um, probably the first one is time issue. I really don't have time to do the tutorials I do here on YouTube each week as well as an extra one for Patreon and I I think if you're paying a monthly subscription on Patreon it's only fair that you get at least one tutorial a week and I'm just not sure I'd have time to do that. Um, plus and probably the main reason is I love the fact that these YouTube videos go out to people for free and that's probably what's more important to me. Um, yeah so <laughs> that's why. So probably the final question from David before I give you the studio tour here is um, what do you love about watercolour? Well, everything really. I love the spontaneity of it, the freshness of it, the unexpected happy accidents we call that you get. I love that. I love being on the edge of control and being surprised myself at what the paint and water can do when you mix them together. It's just such a wonderful and versatile medium. That's the thing. You can use a lot of other media with it. Pastels, acrylics, inks, all of that, which you can't really do so much with, with oil and acrylic. It's just such a wonderful medium. And above all, it's so convenient, especially when you're painting outdoors, just to put a little pan set in your pocket, in your bag, and off you go, and you can paint anywhere. I just love that convenience, and it's clean. We know it's so easy to wipe off from your table if you splatter it. Um, unlike acrylic, as we know, once it's dried and it's hardened, that's the end of it. But with watercolor, you can just re-wet and use it again and again. I just love everything about it. Okay, so now come and join me for a little trip around the studio. Now it's a small studio, so it won't take long, but also a little bit more about how I make my videos. So here is my studio. And just this shot was filmed last summer when the weather was fairly good. Basically, it's a glorified shed, but I've had it insulated and double glaze, so it's quite cozy. Now for a 180 degree view of the inside. So let's have a quick browse of these shelves. Now I've got inks here and pencils, crayons, sponges and just all general art stuff. And down here is my projector and audio visual stuff for when I do demos and talks. Over here I have my bookshelf, lots of art books. And down here all my paints. Can you ever have enough paints? Nah. I love collecting them. I love collecting them and trying out new brands. Tubes and pan sets here. Just loads of stuff. And I do like these palettes. They're great for trying out different mates and colour combinations. Now my little set of drawers here. Lots of spare brushes and pencils. And here. Damn. Now she knows where my secret stash is. Plans chest over here, cutting mat on top. Uh, the top drawer is for all my pads and blocks and loose sheets of watercolor paper. And in this drawer, old paintings and demos. And I'm not gonna show you the other drawers because they're just too messy. Okay, so here is my painting setup. So light is very important. So as well as having lots of natural light, I have these cool and warm white spotlights and I bounce them off the ceiling so as to give me an even reflected light. So to avoid any strong shadows while I'm painting. Sound is also very important. So I use this Rode shotgun microphone. Now for the cameras. Now I think it's important to say that if you're starting out with a YouTube channel, you really don't need lots of fancy equipment. Just a smartphone will do the job. But I now use HD camcorders as I find there's less focusing problems with these than there is with a DSLR camera. 
Now this smaller is a Panasonic and I use this for my talking headshots directly into the Rode mic. And this one is for the overhead painting tutorials. Now this extension bar is very important because it allows the camera to be positioned directly over the painting so it can be filmed dead flat to the work. Now for me there's nothing worse than watching a tutorial that is distorted due to the bad camera angle. So by filming from the front it does mean that your head and shoulders don't get in the way. Although it does mean that you actually film upside down but that's no problem because you can flip that around at the editing stage. Now for the time consuming bit, the editing. Now for starters I have two Apple iMacs. The one on the left I use solely for research, emails, Amazon and all the general everyday stuff. And the one on the right is my dedicated video editing Mac. So when I bought this one I knew that making movies needed a lot of muscle. So I had this one specced up to the highest I could go. The most RAM, the fastest graphics, the biggest hard disk. And for me, it's one of the best investments I made. It just zips along. Now I have been using Apple's own iMovie editing software, which I love, and it comes free with all Apple devices. But I'm slowly moving over to the more professional Final Cut Pro, which isn't free and comes in at about 300 pounds. So what I generally do is film the painting stage nice and relaxed with no pressure. Then I'll edit it, taking out all the unnecessary gaps. Watch it through, taking some rough notes. Then I'll record the voiceover and link it to the relevant section. So I would say the painting and filming accounts are probably about 30% of the time and the editing and fiddling about takes the rest. So the other 80%. And that's how bad my maths is. Now one of my favourite parts of making my videos is selecting the music and I use two subscription based websites Artlist and Epidemic Sounds and the only problem is there's just too much choice. So that's it really, once you've done you simply export the file and then upload to YouTube and depending on the file size that can take up to at least three hours sometimes. So there we go, the sun is just beginning to go down here in not so sunny Sussex and I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did making it. Please don't forget to like, subscribe if you haven't already, leave a comment, I do read everyone and of course I look forward to seeing you again next week for another Watercolour Wednesday. Cheers.